You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Welcome to episode 49 of the GDPR Weekly Show. And as regular listeners will know, I'd like to begin with a shout out to our new listeners. And this week we have new listeners in London, Bristol, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle upon Tyne, Derby, Coventry, Guildford, Leeds, Portsmouth, Cardiff, Swansea, Sheffield, Northampton, Newport, Darlington, Ilford, Glasgow, Nottingham, Wakefield, Twickenham, Dudley, Chelmsford, Taunton and Liverpool. And then in Ireland we have new listeners in Kerry, over in France we have new listeners in Pays de la Loire, Puerto Chirante and Auvergne. In Spain we have new listeners in Navarra, in Porto in Portugal, Haino in Belgium, Nimogen, Gelderland and Tilburg in the Netherlands, Neidersassen and Bayern in Germany, Sidermark in Denmark, Basel in Switzerland, Pimon, Turin, Milan, Rome, Tuscany, Sardinia and Basilicata all in Italy, Mazowiecki and Wilkoposki in Poland, Stockholm in Sweden, Hordeland and Alstalga in Norway, Tavastia in Finland, New listeners in Serbia, in Bucharest and Kavazna in Romania, in Istanbul in Turkey, in Tel Aviv in Israel, in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, in Johannesburg in South Africa, in Lahore in Pakistan, in Uttarakhand and Tamil Nadu in India, in Singburi in Thailand, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, Hokkaido, Saitama and Toyama in Japan, Chung Chong Bukto in South Korea, Adelaide, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth all in Australia, Auckland in New Zealand, Santa Cruz and Cordoba both in Argentina, Rio Grande, Sao Paulo and Peel all in Brazil, Sonora, Chihuahua, Cahuilla and Mexico City all in Mexico, British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Ontario, New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Labrador, all in Canada. And then this week in the USA, we have new listeners in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, Wichita, New York, Columbus, Houston, Nashville, Atlanta, Harrisburg, La Crosse, Eau Claire, Hartford and New Haven, Colorado Springs, Dallas, Bismarck, Washington DC, West Palm Beach, Birmingham, Little Rock, Richmond, Petersburg, Dayton, Ames, Yuma, Washington DC, Fort Worth, Pine Bluff, Stranton, Austin, Baton Rouge, Portland, Orlando, Daytona Beach, Charlottesville, Denver, Las Vegas, Philadelphia and Chicago. So as you see, or as you hear, a uh, wide range of cities and new listeners right around the world. Special mention, I think, to our new listeners in Sardinia, because you're your first from there. Uh, great to see increased coverage in Poland, and of course great to see increased coverage right across the Far East, and indeed across the USA. Uh, so a big warm welcome from me to all of you new listeners. I do hope you find the show interesting and entertaining, and keep coming back week after week. And of course, as always, a big shout out to all my regular listeners, uh, over a thousand of you now who tune in every week to listen to the latest news in the world of GDPR. And in just a moment, I will be telling you what's coming up in this week's episode. But as always, I welcome your feedback. And if you have any feedback on things you hear in the show, or you have ideas of things you'd like to hear in the show, or indeed people you'd like me to interview, or indeed if you are someone who'd like to be interviewed by myself onto the show, then please just drop me a line by email to podcasts at insurety.co.uk that's E-N-S-U-R-E-T-Y dot co dot UK or go to our website at www.insurety.co.uk go to the podcast page and you can contact us from there. So in just a few moments I'll be telling you what's coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Check us out on Facebook. So coming up in this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show we look at the $5 billion fine imposed on Facebook for its part in the 
Cambridge Analytica scandal. We have details of a new website set up for people affected by the British Airways data breach where they can go to see if they can claim compensation. We have a comparison of the GDPR penalties across Europe. We have news of a London estate agent being fined £80,000 for a data breach. And in concluding this week's episode, we have the final part of our interview with Mark Wellins from OneTouch.io. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. If you listened to last week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show, then you'll know that we said that we would this week bring you details of the penalty to be imposed on Facebook for its part in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Well, it's now been disclosed that the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, has reached an agreement with Facebook to levy them with a $5 billion fine as part of their settlement. Subject to final approval by the US Justice Department, Facebook will face the $5 billion fine, which will be the largest financial penalty a tech firm has been handed by any government regulator for breaching data protection laws. The fine is many, many times larger than the French Data Protection Authority's £44 million fine against Google earlier this year, or even the uh, £183 million fine from the British ICO against British Airways, which we featured last week. And so uh, this new fine for Facebook very much puts it into a different league. But then, of course, Facebook is in a different league in terms of its uh, turnover and also in terms of the number of users affected. The agreement, which was reached following months of negotiations between Facebook and the FTC, also sees Facebook subject to greater oversight. But the social media giant will not be restricted in the way that it shares users' data with third parties. Many, including Carol Cadwalder, the observer journalist who initially broke the Cambridge Analytica's story, have branded the settlement inadequate and indeed some in the industry have described the agreement as a sweetheart deal and that for all the FTC has imposed a fine, uh, Facebook continues to be pretty well out of control. But to put it into context, the $5 billion fine represents approximately 9% of Facebook's annual turnover for 2018 and is more than double what the maximum penalty could have been under GDPR if an EU regulator had fined the company. But perhaps giving an indication of how the stock market views Facebook, when news of the $5 billion fine broke, Facebook's share price actually went up, with investors pleased that the FTC's investigation will soon conclude without spilling out into a lengthy saga that dominates newspaper headlines not just in the US, but also across Europe, of course. Moreover, the company has cash reserves of more than $40 billion, so they really won't have any problem finding the $5 billion that they've been fined. It wasn't a clear run thing, though. The settlement was agreed by a 3-2 to two majority vote of the FTC's board, split on party political lines, with the Republicans in favour of an agreement and the Democrats against. Facebook was also found to have violated a previous settlement with the FTC that it struck in 2011, after the firm was required to change its privacy policies following widespread criticism. Following the launch of its investigation into Facebook's data practices in March 2018, the US regulator had been expected to levy a fine somewhere in the region of $3 billion to $5 billion. so the fines actually come up come in at the upper limit of what might have been expected. The outcome of the settlement negotiation was also previously thought to include a clause in which federally appointed privacy executives would be injected into the highest level of the company, but that hasn't happened. The UK's ICO, you might remember, our information commissioner, fined Facebook half a million pounds for violating the Data Protection Act in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and that was the maximum they were able to impose at the time because the Cambridge Analytica scandal itself took place before GDPR came into operation. This is not quite the end of the story for Facebook, though, because the Irish uh, 
Information Commissioner, is currently pursuing 10 other investigations into the way that Facebook handles data. And given the, the figures which the British uh, Information Commissioner has imposed recently on not just on British Airways but also on Marriott Hotels, it's not inconceivable that Facebook could face further fines into the tens if not the hundreds of millions of pounds or euros from the Irish data regulator. But we're not yet certain when the Irish regulator is going to issue their judgment. But once we do know, we will, of course, bring it to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. If you attended our GDPR training sessions in the last 12 months, or indeed if you're a regular listener to the GDPR Weekly Show, then you might well know that our view was that given that ambulance chasing lawyers could no longer chase PPI claims, that they might well turn their attention to GDPR. And it's not taken long for that to happen. In the light of the large fine that the British Information Commissioner's Office imposed on British Airways, a law firm, SPG Law, a trading name of Excello Law Limited, have set up a website called badatabreach.com where they are inviting people to go to the website and see if they can claim for compensation against British Airways as a result of the data breach. Um, the website's been advertised quite widely. We've actually seen it advertised on Facebook. I believe it's also been advertised on other social media and presumably on other platforms too. The lawyers are not doing anything wrong in this. Of course, they're perfectly entitled to do what they're doing. And they're looking to bring a class action against British Airways for damages as a result of the data breach that British Airways suffered. Now, it's important to stress that these damages being pursued through a civil court action are quite different to the criminal fine that was imposed by the Information Commissioner's Office on British Airways itself. So British Airways has to pay the fine, but this is also now about compensation to individual British Airways customers. And on the website, SPG Law are pointing out to people that you could be eligible for up to £2,000 or even more. To quote from their website, BA announced on the 7th of September 2018 there had been a breach of its security systems leading to more than 500,000 customers having their personal detail leaked. This sensitive personal data included full names, debit and credit card numbers, including the expiry dates and importantly the CVV numbers, the, the three digits on the signature strip on the back of your credit or debit card, addresses and email addresses. This breach has led to all customers being required to monitor financial transactions on their debit and credit cards and potentially cancel or request reissue of their payment cards. BA's response has been to only offer to reimburse customers who suffered direct financial losses and to offer credit monitoring. This is not good enough. SPG Law correctly points out that under Article 82 of the EU General Data Protection Regulation, those residents affected have the right to claim compensation for non-material damage. This means compensation for inconvenience, distress and annoyance associated with the data leak. This is not the first time that BA's IT systems have failed, the law firm are keen to point out. So, how do you obtain compensation? Well, you go along to the website at www.badatabreach.com BA data breach being all one word and you join the group action which SPG Law is hoping to bring on behalf of thousands of people who are potentially able to make a claim for damages against British Airways. They're saying that they do everything possible to make the claim as simple as possible and basically on the website they then have a form for you to complete and they have a, a box that leads you through it. They have some useful frequently asked questions on the website. I won't run through all of them, you can see them on the website, but I will point out a couple where they say, uh, one question for example, how much compensation will I receive? And SPG Law is saying, we believe we'll be able to claim significant compensation in the thousands or possibly tens of thousands, depending on individual circumstances. 
Will you have to do the talk? Probably not. What will it cost me? They're saying it's no win, no fee. They won't get paid unless you win, which you know is how no win, no fee normally works, of course. Um, but what's interesting is what they will then take from you in fees. Because what they're saying is for clients who signed up pre 6th of April 2019, I think that's hmm, unlikely to be that many people since I as rather well know people at that stage weren't aware that this class action was going to be brought. But anyway, they're saying for clients who signed up pre 6th of April 2019, SPG law will recover 100% successfully from the defendant. And so you will keep 100% of your damages. For clients who sign up post 6th of April 2019, i.e. now, SPG Law will take 35% of any compensation. So do bear that in mind that should you choose to go this route with SPG Law and they do win the compensation from British Airways, which of course is not a certain, then they will take 35% of any compensation. What they are saying though is also that they will have insurance that should... SPG Law lose their case against British Airways that you as an individual within the claim won't have to pay anything towards British Airways legal costs. So it's pretty no risk as far as individuals are concerned. So if you think you might have a claim against British Airways under the state of breach then do go along to https colon slash slash www.badatabreach.com and see whether it, it looks to be a good match for you. I think it's important to clarify at this point that we at GDPR Weekly Show are totally independent. We have no financial or any other link with SPG Law and we offer no endorsement of their policy or their likelihood of success you're listening to the gdpr weekly show with your host keith budden if you were listening to our show last week you will have heard us mention that the british ico the british information commissioner had issued these large fines against british airways and marriott hotels and that those were the first substantial fines under GDPR that have been issued in the UK. And that we also, in the same episode, covered that in Romania, a bank, a Unicredit bank, for a data breach not dissimilar to the size of the data breach at British Airways, had by the Romanian data watchdog, actually they only been fined 130,000 euros, which is obviously a big difference between 130,000 euros and 183 million pounds, even though the bank failed to protect the personal data of its customers and the breach affected over 337,000 people. So one of the things we raised there was the whole issue of, although GDPR being the same set of rules right across Europe, that fines and penalties were varying widely. And so just want to cover that a little more this week. So if you bear in mind, we've got £183 million in a fine from the UK ICO. We've had a fine of just over £50 million to Google from the French ICO. Against which we have this fine of £130,000 thousand euros against Unicredit by the Romanian Information Commissioner. So what about the rest of Europe? Well, in Poland, the biggest fine so far has been against an organisation called Biznode, and the Polish Information Commissioner fined Biznode 220,000 euros. Meanwhile, in Bulgaria, we don't have details of who the fine was issued to, but the biggest fine issued so far has been 27,000 euros. In Hungary, 40,000 euros and in Lithuania, €61,500. So none of them coming anywhere close to what the British and French information commissioners have imposed, and indeed not even coming close to what the UK information commissioner has imposed under the old Data Protection Act. But if you thought it was only in Eastern Europe that there were relatively small fines for 
infringement of GDPR, you'd be wrong because on the 28th of May 2019, the Litigation Chamber of the Belgian Data Protection Authority issued its first decision of imposing a fine for violation of GDPR since GDPR came in on the 25th of May 2018. The Litigation Chamber's decision concerned the use of email addresses that were initially collected by a mayor in the context of the exercise of his public function in order to send me materials in relation to his electoral campaign and they fined the mayor two thousand euros to give a little bit of background on the 12th of december 2018 the plaintiffs lodged a complaint with the belgian data protection authority against the defendant in its capacity of mayor in relation to the misuse of their email addresses which had been provided by the plaintiffs architect to the defendant in the context of an urban planning request the mayor reused the email addresses to send the election propaganda to the plaintiffs. After hearing both parties, the Belgian's DPA litigation chamber ruled that the defendant had breached GDPR. The principle of purpose limitation set forth in Article 5 1B of the GDPR prevents the controller from using personal data for new purposes that are incompatible with the purpose for which the data was initially collected. In the case of the mayor, the reuse of the email addresses initially collected by the defendant was a clear violation of Article 5.1b. Although the amount of the fine issued, €2,000, is relatively small, and in this case the uh, Belgian ICO is arguing that the fine is small due to the limited impact of the infringement and the number of individuals affected, the litigation chamber nonetheless declared that the conduct of the defendant constituted a serious infringement of GDPR. The litigation chamber went on to insist that the fact that any controller must take GDPR compliance seriously, particularly when it comes to hold as a public office such as a mayor. The Belgian DPA also outlined that citizens should be able to trust that the personal data they share with public officers in the context of public officers' duties will not be illicitly reused for incompatible purposes and in particular for private purposes. The Dutch Data Protection Authority, Auto Retic Person Gevens, and apologies for any Dutch speakers, I probably totally mispronounced that, so I'll refer to them from now onwards as the Dutch ICO, issued its first GDPR fine of €460,000. The fine was imposed on the Dutch Haga Hospital for having insufficient internal security of patient records. Interestingly though, in this case, the Dutch ICO has chosen to not just issue a fine, but also issue a cease and desist order. The effect of this order is that if the hospital has not improved its security of patient records before October the 2nd, 2019, it must pay another €100,000 every two weeks, with a maximum of €300,000 until it's put sufficient security and improved data processing measures in hand. The Dutch ICO had proved that the healthcare industry must take all technical and organisational measures to ensure that patient information is secure. Now this fine in the Netherlands didn't come as a total surprise. The Dutch ICO has for a while indicated that it was intending to focus initially on the healthcare industry. Prior to imposing the fine, the Dutch ICO initiated an investigation. After 197 employees at the Dutch Haga Hospital had access to medical records of a Dutch celebrity. The celebrity remains unnamed. During its investigation, the Dutch ICO checked whether the hospital's information security systems met the security requirements of Article 32 of GDPR and concluded that they didn't. In a report, the Dutch ICO concluded that Haga Hospital had taken insufficient security measures with respect to authentication and control of logging, which constitutes a breach of Article 32 of GDPR. With respect to authentication, the hospital did not have two-factor authentication in place when it came to patient records. With only doing a random security check of six patient records a year, the Dutch ICO mentioned that the hospital did not meet the requirement of systematic risk-orientated intelligent control, in particular considering the scale of data processing by the hospital. The Dutch ICO concluded that the login control must be systematic and consistent. And so I think that's quite interesting as well in itself when you look at some of the detail of that ruling because it's the first ruling I've come across where there's been a cease and desist order accompanying the ruling, i.e. 
you know, you get a fixed penalty now, but you then get further penalties if you've not complied within a certain time period of the original judgment being made. And secondly, that they actually got a penalty because two-factor authentication was not in use. Now, although two-factor authentication is recommended, there's actually nothing to say that you have to use two-factor authentication. But the implication of this is that for sensitive data, that it will be a requirement to implement two-factor authentication. So if you're not sure what two-factor authentication is, or you need some help with implementing two-factor authentication in your individual organisation, please do get in touch with us. Just drop us an email at podcast.insurability.co.uk and we'll do our very best to point you in the right direction and get two-factor authentication sorted out for you. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. A London estate agent has been fined £80,000 by the Uh, Information Commission's Office, the ICO, for a breach under the Data Protection Act, which could have been a lot more if the ruling had come under the GDPR. The ruling came under the Data Protection Act because the actual data breach occurred prior to the introduction of GDPR, even though the penalty has only been issued now. Um, the breach took place between March 2015 and February 2017 and the ICO has ruled that Parliament View Limited, the estate agent concerned, had left the personal details of 18,610 people available online for just under those two years. The data was from both tenants and landlords and included bank statements, salary details, dates of birth and other information including copies of passports. So, Based on what we were saying earlier, um, I think this estate agents can consider themselves very lucky that GDPR was not in place at the time because I think they would have found themselves landed with a fine of far more than £80,000. The company only told the ICO about the breach when it was contacted by a hacker who had downloaded the information. The ICO said that its investigators had uncovered a catalogue of security errors and found that Parliament View, Life at Parliament View Limited had failed to take appropriate technical and organisational measures against the unlawful processing of personal data. Steve Eckersley, the Director of Investigations at the ICO, said customers have the right to expect that the personal information they provide to companies will remain safe and secure. That simply wasn't the case here. We found that they had failed to adequately train their staff, had misconfigured and used an insecure file transfer system, and then had failed to monitor it. These shortcomings had left its customers exposed to the potential risk of identity fraud. Because of the data these losses, unfortunately we've only been able to find them under the 1988 Data Protection Act rather than a more punitive GDPR. If there are any updates to this story, we will of course bring them to you in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. And now is the interview spot on the GDPR Weekly Show. So coming up now, we have our final part of our interview with Mark Wellens from OneTouch.io. And I hope you find this as useful and as informative as you have the previous three parts of this interview. You know, the, the, I, mean, I, I mean, I think it's fair to say there's two sorts of people making the inquiry. There's the, the genuine inquiry of, Hey, I'm Joe Soap, and, I, and I, I want to know what you hold about me. But there's the other inquiry of, hey, I'm Joe Soap, and I want to know what you hold about me, because actually I want to know what you're not going to release to me that I know you hold, because then I can see you. And, and then we have the ambulance chasers. <laughs> yeah. I, and, and, you know, I mean, I mean, I had a situation with a company not so long ago who, who came to me for some advice because they were being chased by one of these ambulance chasers who were suing them for quite a substantial amount of money because they hadn't supplied all the data and the compensation they were claiming was for their client's distress. <laughs> yeah. American. Yeah. Definitely. Now, now if, if, if I knew that somebody had a, a, an address of mine from 10 years ago and they didn't now tell me they had it, would that actually cause me distress? Well, maybe it might me a little bit but you know <laughs> it, 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 is is that is that bit of being peeved worth ten thousand pounds i'm not sure it is yeah 
well, yeah, it's it's worth what you can get for it, but no. <laughs> well, well absolutely, and it was what, what these administrators are working on as well, and, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say, is they're working on the basis of, well, what's it worth to keep it out of court? There's one part of GDPR that I find um, is more of a, a fear component than anything else, and I, I know that you've you've talked about it, and it and it obviously is part of GDPR, but but that's the paper records that yeah. sit in filing cabinets and, and are generally locked away, because when when I think about the 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 risk potential of a locked mm. filing cabinet versus the risk potential of an Excel spreadsheet with you know five thousand mailing addresses, yeah. it, it, it's it's not comparable. No. We're not talking, but it's certainly in there. And from my, you know, from my naive perspective, let's call it, I think it's more of a fear factor. And yeah. it's just trying to say, we're being very thorough with GDPR. We want you to understand the seriousness of it. Um, and you have, to, you have to find all of that data. Yeah. Whether, you know, what you can do with the, the filing cabinet, apart from lock it and burn everything if you don't really need it, mm. maybe that's part of it as well. Do you guys really need 25-year-old files? Well, well, well that, that, that's absolutely right. And I, and I think certainly organizations that I, I've been working with, it's something I try and engender in them is actually think how, why do you need that information? Yeah. If you've got that filing cabinet that's actually sitting at the back of the shed and it's been there so long that it's covered in 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 three inches of dust just three inches do do, do you really need it yeah you know is your organization really going to lose anything if you destroyed it against the risk you're running by the fact you're still holding it and and i think that's the really that's the really tricky one but i think as well i, I don't know if you saw this thing that came out last week where um I believe it. Yeah, it was a Danish ICO has actually now fined a, a company because they had a document retention schedule that said they retained data for two and a half years. And the ICO went into this company and did an audit and found data that was older than two and a half years old. And so they fined the company because it wasn't sticking to its own data retention schedule. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, I th and again, I think that's one of these things with GDPR, which is there, which not really not many people have paid much attention to yet. But I think they will, because you can bet your life if one ICO is starting to do that, then the others will start to pick up on it too. Um, yeah, and don't so let the hear about that. <laughs> and so I think, you know, there, there are just all these areas where, and I guess again, it's where, where, where things like your solution work so well, because... It's an old adage, but we, we don't know what we don't know. Right. And, right. And so, you know, the, the, by trying to minimize the amount that we don't know, at least if we know what's there, we know what data there is, and we know roughly how old it is, where it's stored, as you say, whether there's any PII in there. At least that puts us probably a step ahead. Because, I, again, it's one of the things which I had dealing with a, a local authority, and I was talking to them and we were talking about data subject access requests. And I said to them, what if you had someone came to, you, you know, day one after GDPR and you get 10 data subject access requests, want to know everything you hold about them. Yeah. Yep. And the guy went, well, that's okay. Yeah, we could handle that. I said, and then the next day there's another 10 and the next day there's another 10 and the next day, there's another time. And he, he, he suddenly was like, well, no, we probably wouldn't have the resource to handle that. I said, and then add on to that that you've got 30 days to provide that information or come up with a damn good reason why you can't do it in 30 days. And suddenly it becomes much more of a problem, you know. Yeah. And, and I, said, I said, you know, one of the things, I mean, I've I worked with a number of local authorities and probably a good proportion there of the inquiries they get are actually not people who have any real interest in the information that is held. They don't have a financial interest either. They just take it as an opportunity to get one back at the local authority to wow. give them a chicken. Wow, human and, psychology. And, and, and make them do some work, yeah? Yeah. No, it's, uh, it, it, I, I do think that um, the, the I, I'm going to say the, uh, the wild card here is is the human behavior piece? Mm. You know, because what is the motivation? I mean, what is the motivation behind keeping twenty five year old filing cabinet? Really, at the end of the day, it's if you think about you know when when you if you have, if you work in a company and you say, hey, could you get me some you know some headphones, whatever it is, and yeah. they give you the headphones and and you think, oh, 
yeah, maybe I'll use a Skype or, you know, or Zoom or whatever it is for, for meetings. It's going to save money. And so you get that you open your case or the help desk and they open the firewall rules for you and you start to use Zoom or whatever it is. And at the end of it, you decide, actually, it's too much hassle. It doesn't save me time. It doesn't save me money. So human nature is the first, like the last thing I'm going to do is give the headphones back and tell yeah. the security team they can close up that. I have something. It's mine now. It's like that yeah. filing cabinet. It's yeah. like the guy going to the, the local council. Hey, you've got something of mine. Uh, I'm, I'm psychologically, I'm going to make your life hard now. Yeah. It, yeah. It's about human behavior. That, and mm. that's not really in GDPR, but it affects a lot of what we do about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What can, what can you say? <laughs> we, we are just human at the end of the day. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it, it, it's been a really useful discussion, Mark. Um, how, how can listeners find out more about OneTouch.io and uh, and your services. We would we would love to see you guys uh, join us on on the website. Look us up there. Uh, just OneTouch.io. You will find us. We're also on LinkedIn. You can find us there. I can't be bothered spieling off a whole you know HTTPS blah 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 blah. You can find us there. Um, but we're also we're <laughs> we're a gregarious bunch. I think that's a good word. If it means what I think it means. Uh, different trade shows around the different countries. Um, we we just available really best case through website tom is in charge of that he's hiding right now but uh you can get us through linkedin too fantastic okay well thanks mark it's been really good to uh, chat to you yes and uh, appreciate your time keith been very helpful and, and matt uh, thank you for setting it up man and uh ho- hopefully speak to you again in a, in a future interview on on uh, the duty power weekly show I'd, I'd love that thank you yes thanks thank you okay thanks mark um, yeah, you're uh, welcome. Matt, you up there? Yeah, Thanks. I'm here. Hey, Keith, uh, just a quick question for you. When when should we be on the lookout for um, for this uh, publication for the for the produce and Matt? This was live, man. Everyone's <laughs> hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I would hope to get it into the one that we're going out. Well, I, I'm probably gonna because we've got quite a length. I'm probably gonna split it into two. Okay, so great. I'll, I'll probably run part of it this this Sunday and probably part of it the following Sunday. Okay, that works. Thanks a lot. We really appreciate it, Keith. And if you have any follow-up questions, you can just send them over to me. I'm happy to facilitate any kind of uh, communication, but we're, we really, again, appreciate the call and the opportunity. Brilliant. No problem at all. No, it's, it's been really useful. Thank you. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Take okay, care. Thanks. All right. thanks. All right. Bye, Bye, guys. Bye-bye. So that concludes our interview with Mark Wellins from OneTouch.io. I'd like to thank Mark for being an excellent interviewee. Don't forget, you can find all of the previous three parts of the interview on our preceding three episodes of the DigiPal Weekly Show, which you can access via our website at www.insurety.co.uk or indeed via Apple iTunes, Stitcher or any other major podcast platform. And if you'd like to be interviewed on the GDPR Weekly Show, then please do get in touch with me. Just send an email to podcasts at insurety.co.uk. That's E-N-S-U-R-E-T-Y dot co.uk with your contact details and what you'd like the interview to be about. And I'll get back in touch with you, be setting an interview up, which we're broadcasting in a future episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. So that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it entertaining. Please do let me know. Let me have your feedback by sending an email to podcast.insurity.co.uk. You can find out more about us at Insurity at www.insurity.co.uk. And I look forward to speaking to you again, same time, same place, next week. Have a good week, everybody, and remember, keep your data safe. Check us out on Facebook. The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurity production. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash insurity.